I know we have a limited time here today, so thank you for joining us. Um, I am with the Animation Guild. Um, we're a labor union, yeah, for anyone who's members over here. Um, we're here to protect you all and to make sure that we can um, bargain better wages and conditions for you. But we're here with three of our guild members who are going to talk about um, the path to pitching. And so I don't want to take up too much time. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit first off on their journey, their career journey. So we'll start with Jorge. Uh, hello, I'm Jorge Gutierrez, uh, El Tigre, uh, The Book of Life, and most recently, Maya the Three. Hi everyone, I'm Rob Hoagie, a uh, writer uh, predom predominantly, but also now executive producer. Uh, my current show, Stillwater, airs on Apple TV Plus. Most recently also, I've done Nico and the Sword of Light for Amazon Prime. I did the original Teen Titans on Cartoon Network, and a whole bunch of stuff in between. Hi, um, my name is V, and I'm the little baby here. <laughs> I've been pitching a ton. Uh, I've been a storyboard artist and director um, recently on Wings of Fire. And um, I'm really excited to say that I got a short uh, greenlit by Cartoon Network. So, yeah. <laughs> on Friday, Cartoon Network is still wow. around. <laughs> well, why don't we start off? Um, I wanted to kind of ask the three of you what it was like the first time you pitched, if you can remember that, and um, what you remembered that, um, what you did right maybe, and what you could have done better after, from that experience. Uh, I, I got super lucky. Um, I, right out of school, I started uh, trying to sell a movie because my student short had won a student Emmy, so the uh, manager immediately signed me and said, we can maybe make a movie out of your CalArts short. Uh, so I wrote uh, a 40-page outline of Book of Life, uh, and he sent me to every studio in town. And I pitched Book of Life, and everybody laughed at me and said, you're just some dumb kid out of school. No one wants to see a movie about dead Mexicans. Uh, <laughs> so then, at that point, uh, I, you know, this is early 2000s, I saw a bunch of internet cartoons that were super crappy, and I said, oh. I can do a crappy cartoon too. <laughs> and so I pit, I, I learned my, uh, what was it, Flash, uh, pirate software version of it. I made a tiny little short, uh, you know, after spending three years making this, this uh, CG thesis film, I spent maybe two, three weeks doing this little short with my wife and, and friends from school. And I remember pitching it, and at the first place I pitched it, because I had put it online on, on an amateur site, and it had gotten 20,000 views. The, when I pitched at the time, they were like, this is already a hit show <laughs> on the internet. We want to buy your thing. Mm -hmm. And my show, my, literally my first thing that I pitched, it ruined me for life <sighs> because it made me think it was easy. <laughs> and, it, and it made me think like, this, this is the greatest country in the world. <laughs> they just, they pay you to make your own thing. But the, biggest lesson I got from that was by making something before I pitched, I had already proven to them that I could make stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when I pitched the thing, I remember when I pitched it, I said, it's about a little baby who gets dropped off at an orphanage in the US and he's wearing a Mexican wrestling mask. And no one will adopt the kid because he won't take his mask off. And when he grows up, he fights for the orphanage. So this is before Nacho Libre, before any of that stuff. When the executives heard that idea, this is at Sony, they said, what inspired this? And I said, well, that's me. I am that baby. I got dropped off in the US. The mask is my culture. I refuse to take my culture off. And that will make me strong, and I will fight for the next generation. And they, the executive at the time was like, the story, this is how he said it. The story behind the story is as important. So when we market and we sell you, that's what we're gonna say. The cartoon is its own thing, but this is the complete package. We wanna buy your show. And they're not buying the idea. They're buying you. Mm -hmm. And they're buying you as the vessel of the idea. And I think all that, because it happened so early, it was, you know, again, it was like, 
a baby tasting sugar for the first time. It, it just hit me so strongly how important selling and presenting an idea. To me at that moment, I realized the selling of the idea and the idea itself are separate things. The art of selling is its own thing. And you have to separate them. And so for me, that became the journey. And it was like, I, I'm a student, I love stand-up. So to me, it was, this is like stand-up. When I pitch, I'm going to be terrible, just like comedians are terrible when they first start out. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And at the end of the day, when you're pitching, and this is a big, big, big thing, you should, the words that come out of your mouth, you should be telling the executives or the people you're pitching about a thing you saw already. Imagine if you saw a movie and you're, or a TV show and you're telling your friends, oh my God, you got to see this thing. It's about this, then this happened, and then when you least expect it, this happens, and then guess what happens in the end? This happens. That's how you pitch. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm skipping ahead, because what Jorge just said was, eventually there's going to be a question about how to prepare for a pitch. And if you haven't done it before, the best thing you can do is tell a friend about a show you just saw that they've never seen before, and tell them what it's about and what happens. Because I'm saying yeah. this now before I forget. Because you're already familiar with it, and you're excited about it. Something cool you saw. Because projecting that energy is, is so important. Okay, so my very first pitch, I was just out of grad school. I went to UCLA. I was in the producer's program there for my MFA. Uh, one of the things that we got taught in that class in terms of how to package and sell an independent film was how to pitch. We used to have to go and stand in front of our entire classroom of, of grad students, sometimes big lecture rooms, and because it was UCLA grad school, our teachers would bring in literally heads of studios for these mock pitches, and we would have to sit in a class and pitch a movie to a head of a studio in front of 50 people. That was the very first time I ever got to pitch something, and it was absolutely terrifying. And I figured if I can do that and survive it, I can do anything with a room with two or three people. So the first real pitch I got to do, I wrote a pilot script for a primetime live action series. Uh, it, it was one of those high concept things that a bunch of people liked it. Uh, I got a manager involved, I got a showrunner involved, and next thing I knew, I was going into all the major networks uh, to pitch this primetime drama. And I was a little too excited. I think the things I did wrong. I was way too enthusiastic. Uh, and I think that, I don't think that's why it didn't sell. I think that no one really wanted to buy Baywatch in the woods, which is basically <laughs> what this show was. Now it would be a slam dunk. I could probably go back oh, and yeah, resell it. Though. Yeah, see, that, see, I was like, that was 20 years ago. So, uh, and by the time I got into animation, at that point I felt like I really sort of had the, the, the sales part down. And I think what Jorge says is absolutely true, is that you're not just selling an idea, you're selling yourself. And the big thing that they're gonna wanna know is, you know, ideas are out there, good ideas are out there, but it's kind of a package deal. Because if you're, if you're new, you could go into a studio or a network and have the best idea ever, and almost, and this is, going to sound kind of terrible, but almost the worst thing that can happen is them buying that show from you. Because there's a really good chance that you're not going to be involved. So you got to ask yourself, if you're just getting out there and you, you're chomping at the bit to get your ideas out there, do I want to sell a show or do I want to make a show? Yeah. And you have to be prepared. You have to, you know, look at what the potential consequences of that are going to be because, you know, um, I, my, my perspective was I waited till later in my career to, to pitch original IP because I wanted to be able to back it up with my own resume, with my own experience, and there would never be a question of, oh, we got to bring someone in to, to look, at, look after Rob because chances are what's going to happen is if you go and sell a show, they're going to hire someone like me to be your boss which I'm a good boss, but you, <laughs> you, you want to be, you want to run your own show. Well, ideally. Sometimes it's great to just get something sold, but yeah. So that, that my first pitch sort of was a break and then I got into animation and here we are. <laughs> That's, those are such cool stories. I feel like my story is very much like my first pitch was I took an animation production workshop um, because at the time I was in France, I'm, I'm actually French uh, and I started my 
five first years of my career in, in France. And um, I, uh, I took this animation workshop class, which was with Germany and Denmark and France and uh, Hungary. And at the very end, we, uh, they helped us put together a pitch packet. And I was really excited. I submitted it to Annecy. And so I pitched it in front of all the like potential buyers at Annecy. And I was like 21. And I was just like sweating and like falling over myself. Um, and I was at the time, it's funny because they, I pitched it as a uh, direct to streaming or like a direct to TV. And people were kind of like, ah, we don't really know what to do with that format. So I was kind of stuck with something that wasn't really uh, like in the zeitgeist of the market. Um, but it was a really, really cool experience. However, the European market is way more uh, interested in concepts rather than the people, which is something that I had to learn when I moved to America. Um, I've been in, the, in LA now for seven years, and I've pitched uh, mostly through the shorts program. So they have a shorts program with Nickelodeon. It's called the Intergalactic Shorts Program. Uh, I pitched to them probably three or four times <laughs> uh, through all the previous iterations with the boards. And, and what I've learned is that people really want to get to know you, and they want to get to know your resume, and they want to know that, they, that you worked on a show that they know. Um, because for them, when I tell them, like, oh, I worked at, at all these companies here, and, and uh, these are the positions that I've had, they're more likely to trust me because I've proven that I could do it on the previous shows. Uh, um, whereas in France, they would probably be like, oh, yeah, this is a cool idea. Um, but also, what, to echo what Rob was saying, uh, that actually happened to me. I pitched a show. Uh, and they were like, we love these drawings, and then little, and they bought it, and little by little I realized like, oh, I think they're going to bring in somebody else mm. to, to, to uh, take over the show, which makes a lot of sense because it's a business, and they want to make sure they have someone who can make the show. So um, I guess that would be uh, my first experience pitching was at Annecy in front of a crowd wow. of buyers, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I will say... For a lot of you here who want to be creators or are on the process of being in development or, or have your shorts, all the information is out there as far as people's histories. So if you, for example, you would love Gravity Falls and you love Alex Hirsch, you can backtrack, go on IMDb and look at Alex's career and what did, you know, he worked on Flapjack and he worked on Fish Hooks. You can start seeing the patterns mm -hmm. and you start seeing people who worked on Teen Titans, people who worked on hit shows. Those people, usually studios go, well, if you worked on that hit show, maybe you, you were part of the reason it became a hit show. Even if you weren't, they think you are, and that's awesome. And so. you tell them and you yeah, are. And yeah, <laughs> claim it, own it. You own it, and then at the same time, getting, you know, it's a horrible cliche, but it's true. Getting a job in animation, the easiest way to do it is to have a job in animation. Yeah. And what that means is you gotta be somewhere so that you can move up. Moving up usually doesn't happen in one studio. Most people move up by moving studios, right? Those leaps tend to happen by moving. So you want to get in there, and when you look at the history of showrunners, you can study, okay, which ones were the writers, which ones were the directors, which ones were the story artists. So I was coming from character design. So for me, when I looked at the landscape, I said, holy cow, aside from Craig McCracken, almost everybody else is coming from writing or story. So I better learn to write. So I focused on writing and design. And then I realized storyboard is too much work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> but as a creator right now, all the information is out there. Mm -hmm. All those paths, you can see them. I mean, no one's hiding their histories. Mm -hmm. uh, get a, if you can, get an IMDb Pro uh, mm -hmm. account, and then you can look up every executive at every studio mm -hmm. and figure out what they worked on, and just look at shows you admire and creators you admire. Look at the end credits, and then follow the history and go, oh, the board artist in this show went on to be a director on that show, went on to create this show, and you can start seeing the patterns. And you go, all right, I'll start as a revisionist, then I'll become a storyboard artist, then a storyboard supervisor, then a director, and then blah, blah, blah. Like, no one comes out of their mother's vagina and is handed a show. Yeah. <laughs> you that, can quote me on that. That's a good point because, yeah, I, as a storyboard revisionist, you have a far Far, uh, you don't have as good a chance of selling a show as you do as a series right. director. Because, again, it's, it, one of the things it's, it's that this is the hardest part. 
patience. Um, it's, it, it, it's, you know, you, you have to be sort of in, you have to position yourself for success. And, and part of that too is, you know, knowing the people that are doing, that are making the decisions. And sorry to say, you know, the studio executives, network executives aren't really going to know sort of entry level crew people. You know, they might see your work, but they're not going to know you. And the higher up the food chain you get, then you start to have a personal relationship with the people that are actually making the decisions. And that is when, you know, you, you have a much greater opportunity. And not only that, you have a much greater access. And another thing I will add is that even if you are an entry level, level person like a server revisionist, you can talk to your line producer mm -hmm. because I have been on a show where my line producer, she was super great and I would kind of talk to her and now she's one of the VPs on the studio. So um, production people also move up and they're also mm -hmm. a great um, network for you to have. So definitely like nurture these relationships as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's key. Uh, if you look at every executive running a studio, every executive running a division, and again, you do the timeline, they all started as assistants mm -hmm. and worked their way up. So uh, my first pitch at Disney, the guy I pitched to was Peter Gao. He now runs DreamWorks Television. Uh, my first pitch at Nickelodeon was to Marjorie Cohen. She now runs DreamWorks feature. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So be really nice to the assistants. Mm -hmm. Be really nice to everybody. I mean, and you shouldn't have yeah. to try to be nice. No. Just, that's humanity. Yeah. Just be nice. That's right. Well, I, I think we kind of covered the second question, but one thing that I thought would be helpful and beneficial to the audience is to learn a little bit about how you ask for that pitch or how do you actually position yourself. I mean, you've talked a little bit about getting to know people who, you know, an assistant that worked up or whatever, but what are some other ways that people can ask for that pitch? I, I have one thing I want to say, and this is, this is so hugely important. If you're in a position where you will have access, the best thing you can possibly do, unless you know this executive personally, it's called a general meeting, okay? If you can take a general before you pitch, this is, because the, the thing about going in for a pitch is it's in a sense sort of a partially an adversarial relationship because you're trying to get them to buy something that you're selling. But also there is a sense too that they really are rooting for you. But the thing of it is is that when you do a general meeting, which is basically you just go in to meet this person and talk about what you're doing da, 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 and, and, and to get to know them. You just, now you've established a relationship and they, and, and they sort of, they're checking you out. They're like, okay, this is a person that I can trust. They, this is someone that I think, you know, might have good ideas. And if you're lucky, in the room, they'll say, so what are you working on? Do you have any pitches? And then you can soft pitch. Or you can say, yeah, I'm working on something really cool, but also you can do recon. Figure out what they're looking for, what, what, they, what they're not looking for is even more important. And you can sort of do, you, do your research. Um, so I, I jumped ahead, but yeah, I, I just wanted to mention general meeting before we got I too far into it. I wanna kind of piggyback off that because generals is something that I learned about very recently, just like within the last year. And it's such a big thing to ask for because this is exactly uh, everything Rob said. And um, during a general, you want to kind of like have already your own pitch figured out. Like, who are you as a person? What are the things that you love to do? Are you more of a comedy person? Are you more of a drama person? So you're pitching yourself kind of like also for any potential jobs in the company, like and tell, and you can also say like, oh, I'm a writer, or like I really want to like uh, go for t towards that position, and then that exec can also keep an eye out for you. So uh, generals, hundred percent. Yeah, and you can also sort of couch that as like a casual, like, hey, can we meet for coffee, or can can we just do a quick Zoom, um, and and those sorts of easy, casual, no pressure, because. If an executive doesn't know you, unless it's sort of like set up by an agent or a manager or a trusted producer or someone's like, you gotta meet this person, they're awesome, they're gonna be on fire, you gotta be da da da, um, it, it takes the pressure off. And, and that way, you, you're, again, you're starting to nurture these relationships because it's much easier for an executive to, to buy a project when it's someone they know. So. And, and then development, you know, it, it's a, it's a lot of steps, right? So usually when you pitch an idea, it, again, it's easier if you're already working at the studio, already working on something else, because then you hear about 
oh, development's looking for things, and then the EPs or the directors on your show can recommend you. If you're you know, killing it and you're really good, literally they will go to the showrunner and go, all right, who are the badasses on this group? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's how that happens, right, that magic. And people are like, well, that's nepotism. That's not nepotism, yeah. you're just killing it and people mm -hmm. want to recommend you. Yeah. So the, the, once you get that opportunity, then it's on you to do what Rob said and, yeah. and, and, and echo what he's saying, you gotta do the research and you gotta go, what shows have not worked around here? What are the hit shows? I gotta make sure I don't pitch anything close, mm -hmm. right? At Nickelodeon, the joke was when people would pitch underwater shows. It's like, you have SpongeBob. Why yeah. would you do that to yeah. yourself? So that, that idea of, all right, I'm gonna pitch my thing. They like my thing, they do an option. An option is basically they rent your idea for two years and give you, I don't know, $20,000. In those t two years, you're gonna develop your idea with them and you're going to you know, hypothetically write a pilot and design characters and do a Bible and do all these things. You will get paid for all those things, but no one can afford to make a living in development. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a job and they do development on the side, unless you're super rich. Mm -hmm. uh, or unless you saved up a ton of money, you're like, all right, I'm gonna you know, eat a cup of noodles for the next two years. <laughs> Most people can't afford to do development, so it's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. After that happens, after your script, your pilot script happens and your designs happens, then you go to boards. Mm -hmm. Boards go well, then you go to do an animatic. Then the animatic goes really well. Some studios will actually animate the show. Most places will not. They will just test the animatic. Then they buy your show. So that patch can take five years. It can take two years. You never know. The other mm -hmm. crazy, amazing, hysterical Hollywood thing that happens is the moment you have a show optioned, you become the prettiest girl in the party. <laughs> and other studio goes, oh, you have a show in development at uh -huh. Nickelodeon. Disney goes, you know, batting their eyes, come have a show with us. Mm -hmm. And so you start becoming the person who gets to have stuff everywhere and then you get to play them off each other. And that, that's how it happened to us with El Tigre. Uh, after our Sony show got canceled, because of the Sony show got canceled, there's a little box somewhere in Hollywood where once you have your own show, they go, creator. Mm -hmm. And so you're officially a creator. Uh, Disney called us in and said, hey, we saw your little internet cartoon pitches, pitches a show. We had the uh, development show there. Nickelodeon immediately said, you have a show in development there? Come have a show in development here. Mm -hmm. And that was El Tigre. Yeah. So that's how that happens. That, 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 obviously it's different for everybody and the paths are very different. But the, the idea that your show is good or bad, you gotta get rid of that binary way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Is it good for that studio at that moment? Even if it doesn't go through, that doesn't make your show bad. It doesn't make you a bad creator. It's just your show didn't fit at that moment at that place. Mm -hmm. And for you as a creator, fuck, you gotta, you gotta have the heart of a poet, but you gotta have the endurance of a boxer. Because this journey, this marathon, is you're, you're being asked to be incredibly emotional and sensitive while at the same time cold and tactical. And those things for artists are really complicated. So if you can manage to balance those two things and you manage to come to terms with the fact that there's a high possibility that your thing that you think is amazing and incredible won't go through, if you can live with that and you can come to terms with, I'm not a one trick pony, mm -hmm. right? Well, as an artist, you don't go, here's my drawing. Done with drawing. Yeah. <laughs> Mastered it. There, there's one thing that happens at a pitch, especially when they, they can tell you in the room that they're not going to buy it, and that happens a lot. What else do you got? Yep. What else do you got? If you go in to pitch your, your magnum opus, your life's work, you better have a backup, and then that backup better have a backup. <laughs> because the worst thing that can happen, you have access, you're in the room, you have a chance, and you swing and miss, you get as many more chances that you have time for that pitch remaining. So, and there's another thing that can happen out of a, a, an unbought pitch. And this actually is the thing that oftentimes people forget about. If they like you, but for whatever reason they don't buy your show, you are already pegged to someone that, that is like, you get the check mark next to your name. Yep. You're bona fide. So that gives you two things. Actually, more than that. You get a free opportunity to go back anytime. Because if it goes well in the end, I'm sorry, we, this isn't going to work for us right now. We've got other things in development that are similar to this. Come back anytime. 
I'd love to hear what else you've got. But here's another thing that can happen. If you're a visual development artist, whether you're a director, whether you're a writer, they often, almost always, need other artists and writers to hire to do the development work on shows that they have already optioned or bought. So they might not like your show that you pitched them, but you know what? You know, V might be really good for, you know, the Flying Hippo show. And then they say, well, well, we got this thing. Would you want to take a look at it? Maybe do some, maybe do some boards, may, may, maybe write a pilot, you know. It gets you development work. And then here's the thing. That show gets greenlit. You may not have created it, but you will yeah. likely be involved in a meaningful way. So just because as a creator you don't sell the show that you went in originally intending to pitch doesn't mean that you can't at some point turn that into an opportunity to be um, a showrunner in another, on another, someone else's project. And then the more you do that, the more opportunities you have to finally hit one out of the park and sell your own idea. Because that does not happen nearly as much. I mean, I've probably done, I don't know, a dozen shows or more as like a head writer, as the producer, as the showrunner. Of all those shows that have like the top of the food chain, only one of them was one I actually literally created myself. But I've had a long career, career making other people's shows, whether it's based on a comic book or a children's book. Um, it, it's amazing when you get to make your own show, but making someone else's is just as gratifying. I agree with um, what Rob is saying because that was the thing that I started doing with like Nickelodeon. I was telling them, well, you know, like I'm, I'm uh, in between jobs right now. If you have like a freelance board you want me to do or any work that uh, you, that is kind of a one-off kind of work, just like hit me up and uh, let's talk. And uh, that way I've helped out with a lot of shows in development. And, Shows in development are always hard to staff because it's not a long gig and a lot of people in animation look for like a safe like one year or two year gig and development, you're gonna be working for maybe a couple of weeks. Um, but that way you get to build these really like nice relationships with the execs and usually you start talking about things like, hey, well, you know, if this ever gets greenlit, which, well, you know, like development, like even if it's not your project, you don't know what's gonna happen to that project. but. Um, I, if it does get made, then yes, you are going to be considered for like a leadership position that is above like the, um, like the, the lower leadership uh, positions, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit, kind of giving our audience here some practical advice. Um, and so this, I guess this question has two parts, which is how do you prepare for your pitch? And there's the sort of long-term preparation, and then there's like the 15 minutes before the room. <laughs> so um, I'd love to kind of get your insight on both aspects of it. All right, I, I, to me, pitch is like war. It's a, <laughs> it's a full-on battle. I like, you know, sacrifice a goat before the pitch. It's like a huge, huge, huge endeavor. I Mr. Robot all my pitches in that I research every single person I'm pitching to and I know their whole history, the name of their dog. Like, I know all of it, where they grew up. Honestly, I, I go super informed. Uh, I, I really research what things the studio is making, what is in development, who do I know at that studio at that time, what is their experience with the people I'm about to pitch. And then I make, especially the last two years, I love pitching on Zoom, because I get to control what people are looking at. And I don't get this encouraged if they, are looking at their phone or they fall asleep or they're doing all this other stuff in the room, I can just focus on my presentation. I time myself, right? So I'm a 17 minute pitcher these days. Uh, and I do, I have all these theories about, there's a small chit chat that happens when everybody's sitting in and you're talking about dumb stuff. That's when I start planting like inception, the seeds of what my pitch is gonna be about. <laughs> then uh, I start with the story behind the story. And by telling the story behind the story, I'm basically already pitching the show. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've laid in that foundation. It's like if you're watching a movie and the composer is giving you the theme of the music and you're not even noticing. So by the time the characters sing it, you're like, oh, this is the greatest song I've ever heard. By the time I pitch, everybody's already had a, you know, a shot of tequila and they, they don't even know that they're about to sing mariachi music with me. And so by the time I get to the pitch, I then go into the big, and I learned over the years, shows are not about worlds, and honestly, shows are not about characters. 
Shows are about relationships, mm -hmm. right? So I immediately go to the core relationship of the movie or the series I'm pitching, and then I take them on this journey, and I basically tell them the whole thing. I don't hold anything back. If I'm pitching a movie, I tell them the whole movie. If I'm pitching a limited series, I tell them where it ends. Uh, spoiler alert, when I pitched Maya, I said she dies at the end. That was a big part of the pitch. Everybody remembers that she died at the end. That was literally the, when they leave the room, they go, hey, well, how was that pitch? It was great, what was it about? And whatever comes out of their mouth, that's what stayed in their head. So with Maya, it was, oh, it's this crazy Lord of the Rings with brown people and then the main character dies. <laughs> that was basically what people would say. Uh. That's the show, right? Yeah. So I, I, I try to get it down and then the biggest thing that I try to do is when I all bring it all together creatively, and again, this is something that took me a long time to come to terms with, then I go into production and I go, Here's the inspiration, here's what I want to make, and then here's how we're going to make it. We're going to do it like this, with this studio, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be like this, it's going to be like this other show, we're going to try to use these. All that stuff is all laid out for them, and whoever I'm pitching to has now all the information, and they have to present it to their boss, or they have to present it to someone else above them, because there's always someone above them. And then they go, all right, I like it, bring him in to pitch me the thing, and you have to accept the fact that you will pitch your thing a thousand times. So you better enjoy it, and you better fall in love with it, and you will keep pitching it forever. And every time you pitch it, you can tweak it, and you can finesse it based on who you're pitching it to. But this thing is a thing that exists until it's done. And I, I would joke that I thought, well, when the thing comes out, you're stop pitching it. Not true. You keep pitching it to uh, retail people and mm -hmm. home video people and yeah. you know everybody even when it gets made you know yeah. the marketing team is gonna come on to do the kickoff and you got to pitch it again to them and yep. it's sort of it's it's always so always I fun. I come to terms with the fact that if I don't love pitching I will never get my stuff made so I better fall in love with it and I better get really good at it and unfortunately now on Netflix they're like oh where is gonna pitch and so I look at the little Zoom thing, and it's like 72 people. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm like, fuck. So, <laughs> and How do I get on that? Well, I see that too. And then they're like, we want you to pitch again. So then I go, fuck, I can't use the same jokes. Like, I got to write new stuff. Uh, so it, it is, it is a, you want them to fall in love with your idea, mm -hmm. but you want them to fall in love with you. Yeah. Preparation is key. And not only being prepared in terms of who you're going to see, um, and, and literally the person in the room, knowing them, of course, is important, but also what does that buyer, what, what are their needs? So doing your homework on that is important. The other hugely important thing is, is that you need to be the first and foremost expert on your show. If there's ever going to be a question that they have about what you're pitching, you need to know the answer or you better be good at making it up in the room quick. And that, I do that all the time. So it, it, that's, that's, that's perfectly legit. The, the key, though, is, is giving them enough, but not too much. Because in my experience, that y if a studio is interested in your project, they're going to want to put their own stamp on it in some way. So you have to be flexible enough and leave enough little empty corners. Well, oh, well, could it be this? Yeah, it could be this. Sometimes the answer is no, it can't be that. You know, of course she's got to die in the yeah, end. Yeah, you know, yeah. no, that's how, that's how it is. But there, it, it, it's called development for a reason. There's a bit of a give and take. Um, preparation is, you know, again, practice your pitch to someone, whether it's yourself in the mirror, tape yourself. Have a, have a friend, uh, you know, pitch it to a friend, pitch it to a colleague, pitch it to your significant other. Get used to hearing those words. It's scary, it's frightening, it is, but you, you get through it. Um, I always, and, and I should say that, that no one is ever going to pitch a show like Jorge. No one's ever going to pitch a show like V or me. Every single one of you, when you go into pitch, is going to be completely different. So don't feel like you have to uh, do things a certain way. Because, it, again, this is a reflection of you as a person, as an artist, as a creator. So do it your way. But know that there are going to be certain sort of benchmarks you need to hit. Um, practicing, again, super important. I always feel like it's important to hold a little bit back. Not important stuff, but you don't want to give too much because, again, 
if, if it feels like you're sort of rambling on, then you start to see them get distracted. So you want to keep it tight. Here's another tip uh, that, that I have learned. If you are fortunate enough to be going out to pitch to multiple locations, okay, uh, you're going to Apple, you're going to Amazon, you're going to Netflix, you're going to Disney, you're going to Cartoon Network, you're going to Nickelodeon. We got those six pitches set up. You've done your research, okay? And you know uh, this, is, this is almost an impossible sell at Apple. It is, it is not within their mandate. They're giving us this pitch as a courtesy. Go there first. That is your practice pitch. Save the, save the place that oh, you, Mark. save the place that you know this is a slam dunk for your very last pitch for a couple of reasons. One, you've now had five other places to practice that pitch in front of a live executive audience. And by the time you get to that last one, you know what works, you know what doesn't. Every time you pitch that show is going to be different because you, you know, that part I got stuck on or, or they responded really well to this part. I'm going to focus more on this. It's, it's, if you go in literally reading off a piece of paper, it, it's, it's over before it begins. You need to have this internalized in a way. No problem having crib sheet in front of you. If you need to have bullet points to make sure you keep on track, totally fine. But it needs to be eye to eye, OK? Um, and then the, the other thing is, if you get to that last place and say, pitch number four, they're really interested. Pitch number five, they're really, really interested. And pitch number six, where you really want it. Now you have a little bit of competition, perhaps. So that can actually work in your advantage because they know that, oh, you know, if you're fortunate to have a manager or an agent, they say, yeah, Nickelodeon's really interested. They'll sort of plant that seed and then maybe you'll sell it in the room to Disney. That, that does happen. So. Yeah, I think like um, obviously everything that Jorge and Rob said, <laughs> um, for me, I, I actually keep my pitches uh, closer to 10 minutes because I feel like right now nobody has time to uh, really sit down and people get distracted so easily. So you really, I really try my best to first when I write out my pitch, I keep it to only three pages, kind of like the shorts program. Uh, I want to make sure that right off the bat, I start my pitch with something that is like, this is why you guys will care about this show. So. Is this the, the core relationship? How, how is it that it is me that should be pitching this show? Why is it me and not anybody else? And the way you do that is like you say, um, this is kind of like something that was very meaningful in my life, and this is how I translate it into this uh, show. And usually that's a great gr attention, like a hook for whoever is listening. And uh, I try to pepper in a little bit of like, Jokes, uh, I, I'm not very good at coming up with jokes on the spot, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of more of like a comedian. I'm like, I try out the jokes with my partner, with my friends. If they land flat, I'm like, all right, not this one. Um, but, uh, and also I try to pepper in a couple of like rhetorical questions or questions like, oh yeah, this character is like this other character in this TV show that I love, uh, if you've watched it. And then they're like, yes, I've watched this show. And their attention kind of gets back on, onto your pitch. Um, and I also try, my personal thing is like I try to put in a lot of art. Uh, fortunately for me, I can draw a, a ton. I love drawing, so I try to kind of give them like, look, this is like the eye candy you want for your show, and listen to my words as well, but get distracted by the drawings as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, the 10 minute for me is really important because I've heard uh, from a lot of other of my friends who pitch, uh, I, I remember it was more 20 minutes before. I think 20 minutes, they'll give it to you if you've been in the industry for a long time and you've been pitching a lot. But if you're a newcomer, they just kind of want it short and sweet. Um, and I do practice with Google Slides. There's a really great button that's like the presenter mode where you have your little text on the bottom. I do need my little, uh, how do you call it, like handle uh, to make sure I don't fall in the middle of my pitch. But uh, I, and then I can time myself because then I'm like, okay, I got through the slide in one minute. Great. On to the next one. And if I stumble on some of the words that I wrote, because sometimes I'm like, this sounds great in writing. Then I read it and I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, no, that's not going to fly. So I have to rewrite. I know I put it on paper and then I go back in there and I write the words that are easy for me to say. Um, and... Yeah, I think what Jorge was saying, was, is, which, which is really great, is like, how can you make yourself shine? Like, I, for me, I'm like, oh, I'm more like of a goofy, zany person. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to be like 
the goofball that's just like making weird noises and like, yeah, that's the kind of show you're gonna get. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be how I prepare, I guess. <laughs> I, I my my personal approach to, to 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 pitching is I like to treat it like a conversation. So it's 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 really not about okay, here it is, we fade in. I don't I don't try to paint a picture in in that sort of sense as if to make them see the show. I really sort of get into and this is sort of what you're talking about about how you sort of like what inspired the show. Is I really kind of you know making it a conversation and, and my goal is to get them in a place where they're like. If you have an idea, you're super excited about this idea. And right now, at this moment in time, you're the only one that's excited about that idea. So what you need to do is get them excited about that idea. And the best way to do that is to put them in your frame of mind. Why is it that you're so excited about that? What inspired you to think that this is awesome? And if you can take them, like you said, like take them on that journey where, where you get them into your headspace of why this is exciting, then they're going to be excited too. So that, that, that's why I sort of treat it as a conversation. I sort of, yeah, lay that groundwork. And it's, it's this sort of back and forth. And, like, and you can see their head nodding. They get it, they get it, they get it. And then you can sort of go in for the specifics. And then they get it. They understand the concept. They understand the context. And, and that, I, that, to me, makes it, feel, makes it work a lot better. Because if they're, they're either going to buy it or they're not. Either they're going to be interested in it or they're not. If they're, if they're not, it's a pass. If they're interested in it, they may want to think about it. They may want to, you know, have you know some time to think about it. So that comes to one thing we haven't talked about yet: the leave behind. Mm -hmm. Did everyone know what a leave behind is? A leave behind. Yeah. All right. Leave behind. Yeah. <laughs>